Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, slightly changing tack now, uh, we will talk a bit on the enforcement of safety. And my presentation more or less will touch on the relationship between flag states and port states, some of the best practices and the lessons learned, and also who will be responsible for the vessel's compliance. So I, I will start off with maybe a, a question. Is post-state control considered your friend or foe? I do not expect anybody to answer, but I am sure in private there are a lot of different opinions, depending on your experiences. But we as a flag state, we do find post-state control to be very beneficial. And we do take into account a lot of the information available and the findings from post-state control. And I think one of the key points, or three of the key points, really are transparency, communication, and cooperation. And if we consider these three factors, I think we would find that post-state control can be our friends. With transparency, I think we all should be a bit more open. We should not be afraid of deficiencies. And things always happen on a ship. Things always go wrong. But we need to be transparent. We need to bring it to the notice of the port state, of the flag state, of class, etc. An example of this is even when AMSA go on board, they have reporting systems, but before they start their port state inspection, they always ask the captain, Captain, do you have anything to tell me? They give this last lifeline, and if you take this lifeline, you would save a lot of trouble and probably a detention. Similarly with communication, sometimes when the post state goes on board, the master or the crew may be a bit nervous, but they need to break the ice. Sometimes they, they should go to the post state control officer and say, look, can we have a small opening meeting? So they more or less discuss the inspection. And even at the end, they can ask for a small closing meeting to discuss the deficiencies rather than say, sign the paper and then ask, oh no, it's not like that. It wasn't like this. So a little bit of communication does help. And finally, cooperation. I think we find that you know the post-trade control are quite human in nature, and you need to get to know them better. So you need to sometime arrange meetings with them, or even attend seminars like this, where there is some interaction and exchange. And a combination of all these three factors can help to understand post-trade control better, to work closely with them, and provide and avoid this definition of treating them as an enemy. One of the good points of post state control we find is that they do recognize the responsibility and the effort that ships take, ships that do not have too many deficiencies or do not get detained. At the same time, they do also notice what is poor management, and they give a chance or they use it to improve the management of those ships. We also use benchmarks from, I think, United States Coast Guard or the USCG and the Paris MOU, Tokyo MOU, we can use their findings and we can use it to benchmark which are good operators, bad operators, good ships or bad ships. So some of the information is definitely useful. Turning around to the flag state, we generally, as in our flag state, we use the acronym QCV, which is same as quick closing valves. So we always remember this, except in our case, we talk about quality, Compliance and value. Of course, we like to have a good quality and we like to have our ships compliance. But with value, what we see is we need to provide some value when we go on board for our ins inspections. We need to also be, as a flag state, we need to have a balance. Uh, post state control will just enforce regulations, but with us, we need to also offer a service as well as enforce the regulations. So we like our inspectors to also, when they go on board, they should have a positive and a productive influence on the behavior of the crew. We also believe that we should be managing risk more than just carrying out an inspection. And finally, I would say that whether it's a port state or a flag state intervention, it is basically something to help the ship to get back on track towards compliance. 
And speaking of compliance, this is what we like to see. For example, a ship on the upper left it's got a bold statement, okay, no smoking, most tankers have that, but it has a bold statement that says, protect the environment. Whereas the ship on the lower right, it was meant to say safety first and no smoking, but what's left from there is just first and smoking. So these are sort of things that doesn't give a bold statement that they're being compliant and would create a bad first impression for any post-date control officer. If I could now move on to some of the statistics and our experiences. Basically, in our fleet, we have around 4,500 ships, and 34% of those are bulk carriers. But when we look at detentions, 64% of the detentions are on bulk carriers. So that's something that you need to see if you are a bulk carrier or dry cargo operator. These ships are more prone to detentions. And it's not just our statistics, but you would find that on most of the MOUs. And when we looked at the top five detentions, fire safety was the top, topmost detention, followed by ISM, environmental or MAPOL compliance, life saving and navigation. And I think if you look at any MOU figures or maybe your own statistics within your company, you will find the same five categories, maybe in different order. But since we have fire safety as number one in our fleet, I would just give you a few examples of these deficiencies. And I think because it's a broad topic from fire, prevention, protection, suppression, detection, it can be a big topic. So the first one is the fixed firefighting CO2 system. As you know, most of these flexible hoses should be renewed in 10 years, but we don't need to wait for 10 years if the condition is something like this. So this is a very common deficiency that we find. Another one is similar, the fixed firefighting system, but I show you these examples because on the upper two pictures are actually from new building vessels, and you can see that it hasn't been installed correctly. All the hoses are mixed up. And part of the reason is the clamps securing the bottles were not tight. They were not checked on board. During the voyage, it shifted, and you end up with all the tubes mixed up, and the ship got detained. On the lower left picture is also a fixed firefighting system from a new building vessel that made a maiden voyage from Japan to Australia. The AMSA went on board, and they found a whole bank of CO2 cylinders with the bottle caps on. And when they questioned the ship, they said, no, sir, the shipyard was very good. They gave us a spare set of cylinders. But I think no shipyard is so kind, and actually they weren't connected. They were left out, and the ship got detained. Similarly, on the, on the lower right, there's a, the safety pins in the CO2 bottles have been left in, and there's a small tag there that's saying, please remove after installation. So not only was the pin left in, but the tag was left in as well, which was a straight pointer to the postage control to detain the ship. Quick closing valves, as you all know, the United States Coast Guard has zero tolerance for this. And you can see a gag put in on the right-hand picture, which was a half pipe put in to block it. Many chief engineers, of course, faced with the decision to have a blackout or to have a fire. They choose this option, which is quite wrong, actually, and they, they choose to block the quick closing valve. So this is something that just one quick closing valve block can be one detention. Fire detectors, smoke detectors covered up with plastic. Also, one smoke detector amongst maybe 50 can lead to a detention. You don't have to have all covered up. Just one can lead to a detention. The picture on the right is something that is very common in China, and this is something that the China MSC target on. And that's basically sometimes, you know, ships retrofit equipment, whether BINWAS, VDR, and the crew are told to lay the cables, and then they cut bulkheads, don't put the insulation in, and the Chinese MSC, they love this. They go into cable ducts, broom cupboards, and they find it and detain ships. So this is something to warn your crew. Inoperative stack dampers or maybe the funnel vent or could be the engine room fan vents. I just put this example to say 
that this is a very bad design. And if you are in a position to influence the design on your ships in new buildings, choose something simple. Because when you have something as complicated as this, they will definitely not work one or two years after operation. And finally, I just, uh, not finally, but finally of the examples, switching tax to pilot boarding arrangements. Because we are in Singapore now, and, and this is an example of how a port state and a flag state can cooperate. We have an example, and this is going back from 2015, and it has continued until this year, where there was a pilot boarding a ship, and the pilot ladder broke. Luckily, there was no accident. But the crew were quite happy, and they said, Mr. Pilot, OK, the starboard side is broken. Why don't you come from the port side? But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, because the MPA informed us, or the PSA informed us, that now the pilot is not in the right frame of mind to pilot your ship because he's had a near miss and he's not coming on board and could cause a delay. Similarly, in just a few months ago, we also got a message from the MPA saying, one of the pilots has complained about one of your ships. And when he went on board, this is what he found in the way the pilot ladder was rigged. And as you can see, the pilot expects when he climbs up that ladder to have a nice step and to walk on board the ship. But to his horror, he found that the pilot ladder was rigged to the ballast vent pipe rather than any securing point. So, and it's not just pilot boarding arrangements. We find this with lifeboat, life raft, embarkation ladders as well. So it's just a quick pointer. And finally, we came to talk about the safety of the ship on who's responsible. So there are many levels of safety. You start off with the owner, the operator, the crew on board, the classification societies, the PNI clubs, the flag state, and the port state. And basically, what we would like to say is that we, as a flag state, we are there on every step of the way. So we do talk to owners, operators, the crew during our inspections. We do regularly, on a daily basis, talk to classification societies. We change back and forth ideas, how to solve problems. We talk to PNI clubs, we get their input as well. And also with the port state, we have a lot of exchanges with the port state, and we consider them our good partners. We could finally say that, yes, you don't, we, we have to learn to say no sometimes to the operators. And we can say that they may not always get what they want, but they will definitely get what they need. So to conclude, who exactly is in charge of the compliance on board? Should we have more inspections? Should we have more audits? Should we take into account what right ship is doing or charters are doing or PNI inspections? Should the market forces determine how well a vessel is maintained? Should IMO make more regulations? Should the crew do more? Should the crew agencies do more training? And I think there is no clear answer of who is responsible. It should be a combination of all of them. Thank you very much.